Blue Coat Talks. Welcome to another edition of Science North Blue Coat Talks, a conversation with a guest expert hosted by Blue Coat. My name is Aletha and I will be your host for today. I'm very excited to be welcoming Pietro Giempa to this conversation. He'll be speaking with us about dark matter. October 31st is International Dark Matter Day, and this is just one of many online events celebrating the hunt for dark matter. You can join this conversation at any time by leaving a question or your thoughts in the comments. Welcome, Pietro. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so just before we get started, for those of you out there watching, let's let's just get you warmed up a bit. How about you let us know in the comments your age and what grade you're in or what is the highest level of education you've achieved. And while we're waiting for those to come in, let's start with the first question I have, which is, what is dark matter? Thank you, Alyssa. Well, that is a great question. Uh, dark matter itself is actually extraordinary matter, really. Um, what I mean with that is that we know that there is a huge component of the matter portion of the universe uh, that doesn't seem to follow the same rule as what we call ordinary matter. And that is actually a huge chunk of the universe that behaves that way. And so that's why I, I say it's a little bit extraordinary because it doesn't seem to follow the same uh, rule or guidelines, let's say, that ordinary matter seems to show. Uh, but we do see the impact that dark matter has on our universe, especially from a gravitational perspective. So we have a lot of evidence to know that dark matter is out there and dark matter exists and it has a huge role in the formation structure and existence of the universe. Uh, but because we don't know yet what rules exactly follows and what not, we know very few things, one of which is that it doesn't interact with, with light and this is why it's called dark matter. Um, but it's a huge component of the universe, it's very large and, and it's important to figure out what it is. Okay, that's really interesting. So, so we're interested in it because it, it played we think it played some role in the formation of the universe. What, what kind of role would it have played? Oh, well, absolutely. Um, you know, we live in, a, uh, um, in an expanding universe, obviously, as, as, we, uh, as we know it today. And it all started with the Big Bang. Um, and so if you go back all the way, back in time, all the way at the very origin of the universe, uh, we know that the concentration of ordinary matter and dark matter was in a form of equilibrium. And then when the Big Bang happened, and then the universe started expanding and mass started going in all, all possible directions, uh, we know that dark matter played a significant role in the way that matter was distributed across the galaxy and even the way that the expansion itself occurred. So it played a, 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 substantial, a, a very substantial role even in the formation itself of our own universe. Uh, but it still plays a fundamental role in even galaxies today, we see galaxies where the gravitational presence of dark matter really shapes the, 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 the structure and the behavior of a galaxy completely. For instance, we can see how uh, stars' velocity is impacted by the presence of dark matter across the galaxies and many other examples of that. Wow, okay, so basically it's, it's because of that gravitational force that it has. So it's, it's sort of drawn matter in towards it, so that sort of cosmic web we think of, uh, we think of the large yeah. of the universe. That that web is kind of following following dark matter. Yeah, well, kind of exactly. You can think of it as dark matter really is just an extra a presence of matter, so mass in the universe. Uh, and as I said, they do behave in slightly. They do follow dark matter does follow slightly different rules, but fundamentally is a big presence is a big mass presence in the universe. And we know that gravitationally ma big masses have a strong impact in, in, in the universe and even galaxies and even small formation. For instance, we rotate around the sun because of the mass that the sun has with respect to ours and vice versa. And alternatively, the moon rotates around Earth because of the gravitational bound that the Earth presents to the moon. And so um, uh, dark mass presents a similar configuration across galaxies. Um, that makes sense, okay. so. So that would mean that there's dark matter in our galaxy, right? As we understand it, and we, we think there is. And so that would mean there's like there's dark matter here, right? Like is there is there dark matter around me right now that I just can't Absolutely. see? Absolutely. I mean I, I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing if I wouldn't have think so. Now jokes aside, uh, that's what we believe. 
uh, at least that's what the data is telling us, that we live in a dark matter dominated universe, uh, that there is universe, uh, so there is dark matter within our galaxy, uh, we believe is primarily clustered at the center of our own galaxy, at the center of the Milky Way, but we do expect a, a distribution of dark matter even where we are right now. However, it's important that people understand that dark matter and I know this is a bit of a, a difficult concept to understand, but dark matter interacts or talks to regular matter in, in completely different ways. So while we are surrounded by dark matter, uh, the probability or the chances or, or the reality of a dark matter particle communicating with an atom or, or, a, or an instance of yourself is actually quite low. So while we see in a, in a sea of dark matter, uh, we rarely, very rarely interact with it or communicate with it. Uh, just to give you an idea, you need really tons and tons of material, whether it's solid or, or liquid, uh, to really see maybe a couple of, of uh, interactions per year uh, of dark matter, even though we're completely surrounded by dark matter. Um, and and that's, that's, that's interesting, cool, and, and, and somewhat complicated at the same time, but that's what makes dark matter so unique and interesting. <laughs> Just make it a hard thing to study then. Before we get into that, I, I want to ask you more questions about how you how you actually study this really elusive thing that you can't see um, or apparently touch. <laughs> um, um, but first, I think you know you kind of you touched on it right at the beginning of our talk. But we have to be asking um, why is it called dark matter? So let's just go over that one more time. Yeah. So the origin of the term dark matter was the, the term dark matter was actually coined by Fred Zwicky, who was a physicist in the 30s who first observed uh, the gravitational impact of, of dark matter in our, in our, in, in our universe. Um, he called it dark matter simply because he realized that whatever matter content was there, was present in, in the universe, didn't seem to interact with light in any uh, form that he knew. And so being a physicist and being the creative minds that we are, he called it dark matter because it didn't interact with light. So that's where the term was coined and, and formed. And, and we have used it ever since and never really waved. It's kind of like, like red giants and, and black holes. Yeah, it's very simple. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a very simple and straightforward answer. Just somewhat, it's Occam razor, right? Sometimes the easiest solution is always the best. And this was the easiest term for it and it worked for it. Awesome. So we really appreciate your questions. We appreciate you getting involved in this conversation. So, you know, please um, type those thoughts, those ideas, and those, those questions in, into the comments. All right. So uh, we talk about dark matter as, uh, as, as matter. So we think of it as a particle. Is there, is there any reason we specifically think it's a particle and not just like maybe we're not quite understanding how gravity works? So there's some sort of fundamental law of physics that we... That, we that, that, is, a, that is an absolute great question. Uh, yes, you're correct in the sense that the, uh, the evidence, at least that we see in our universe, seems to point uh, to dark matter being a particle in nature. So ultimately we know that even regular matter, so everything that we have developed and used to build our society on, fundamentally boils down to this tiny, very, very tiny Lego set, basically they're called subatomical particles. Um, and so we kind of believe dark matter has the same uh, structure and same formation. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why we think so is because, uh, as I said before, we see the, Im the gravitational impact, the dark matter as in galaxies. Now, if this effect were to be, say, for instance, a misconception of, gr of gravity, or maybe just the fact that we don't understand gravity yet to the extent of interpreting uh, galactic effects and whatnot, you would expect that to be a uniform and absolute truth across the universe. However, we do see galaxies that have no dark matter content in it at all. Uh, so there, there is absolutely nothing but n what you would expect from standard Newtonian physics happening in those galaxies. So we see, for instance, spiral galaxy where the velocity of stars behaves exactly as Newton predicted. Um, and primary reason, primary explanation for that, among many other reasons why we think it's, it's, it's particle in nature, but one of the main reasons to explain that observation is to, uh, is to accept that, well, 
is to uh, assume the dark matter is particle in nature. And then as the matter content of the universe, universe started expanding at the early stages of the universe, some galaxy brought some dark matter with them, some galaxy didn't bring any dark matter with them, and some galaxy brought very little dark matter with them. And then as they started to expand, that content either dissipated or not. And that's why you see galaxies. Uh, that don't have any dark matter content in it, but that can only be interpreted, at least to the best of our knowledge, as if it was a particle in nature that then as the universe expands and evolves, it distributes in different forms and fashion. So bottom line is that we do believe it's a particle. We do believe in terms of structure is somewhat like natural matter and normal matter. Um, and there are many other evidence that points that way. So we kind of have to believe the, the evidence here. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. So yeah, and when you're talking about like the, the the rate of that stars are moving around so in, in our galaxy the stars seem to be moving faster than we would expect for sort of the given amount of matter that we can see in our exactly. galaxy. exactly right? yeah exactly uh, in other galaxies they're behaving just like we would expect them to so that's yeah that's a great it makes sense that uh it's not just the law of physics that, that there's definitely a particle there now is it possible that it could be more than than one type of particle. And this is actually a question um, from Catherine Blair, who's, who's watching right now. Yeah, that is a great question, absolutely. Um, but what, what the normal scientific approach is, is that you wanna start with the most simplistic uh, case, understand that, and then start to expand from there. Um, there is up, it could absolutely be that uh, dark matter is a, a very complex portfolio of uh, subatomic particles. Um, or there really isn't a reason why the universe decided to go in the most simplistic way and be just a handful kind of candidates and whatnot. Uh, so what we do is that we, we, uh, we have research, we have scientists that look at all the evidence that we have and formulate theories on what the most credited possible subatomic particles that could describe dark matters are and uh, experimentally develop experiments and, and different, uh, um, test to go in and, and, and stress test those hypotheses. And it could be a couple of them are true, it could be multiple of them are true, or it could be that dark matter truly is just an individual subatomic particle style. Um, we don't know that detail just yet, but we kind of following, assuming that it might be different, it might be multiple particles, or it might be just one. Okay, yeah, and from my understanding of it, like researchers have basically been, been ruling out particles or particle types as we go, so, um, you know, I don't know if this is a good way. We haven't detected dark matter yet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's still unopened. It's, it's still an open end. Right? We know what it's not, right? Yeah. Which is one, progress. One of the best way I can explain it is that imagine <laughs> that you are in a big castle, a big castle with over a hundred rooms and dark, no light, no nothing. And you know that your keys are somewhere in that castle. So you know that you lost your keys somewhere in there but you don't know where it is. So the only thing you can do with no light and nothing is slowly go room by room and exclude that room and say, okay, the keys are not in that room and slowly move on to the next one and kind of go from there until eventually you find your keys. And chances are, it's going to be the last one you check. <laughs> and the castle's probably haunted, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, unseen, mysterious things, forces. Okay, so um, I have a question that honestly, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he's asking, but I'm hoping that you do. Um, so this is from uh, Nick Milham, and he's asking, can you please find the dipole moment? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a complex. I think when, when people think about dipole moments, uh, and this is something that researchers are certainly out there looking for it, um, I could certainly spend a little bit of time talking about the technicality of, uh, uh, of the dipole moment, of a single dipole moment, which, I, which I'm sure that's what um, uh, it was asked. Uh, but what, what we do know is that it's not necessarily entangled just yet with dark matter, at least theories don't think that the single dipole moment could be something that helps us constrain dark matter at the moment. So I don't know if that helps you answer your question a little bit, but maybe that's what the only possible explanation I can give right now. But if you want to hear more, just feel free to ping me later on social media. I'll be happy to answer in a little bit more detail. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, OK, so we have we have a couple um, classrooms that are joining us. So Brooke Doran is watching with her physics class. Hi, guys. And um, Maggie DeBella, De Black, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is also uh, Asking for a shout out to Mr. Rod's class in Cincinnati, Ohio. So hey, welcome. 
Um, <laughs> Would this um, be a good time to mention I'm a Cleveland Browns fan? Maybe hi guys from Cincinnati. <laughs> perfect. Um, Sorry about Sunday. <laughs> Brooke is wondering how students get to know more about dark matter. Well, I think what we're here right now, it's a good way to get involved. Uh, obviously, there is the upcoming dark matter day, uh, October 30, uh, 31st. That's, uh, that's very interesting. There's going to be a lot of opportunities across the, uh, the internet and, and many opportunities, even I'm sure in your local area, to learn more about dark matter. Um, if, if those resources are not enough, and I get it, you always want to know more and you always want to learn more, and that's great. Uh, I, I, I will encourage you to, ping, to look at the website, for instance, the SNOLAB website or a website of other institutions that uh, uh, pursue those kind of resources, like, for instance, the McDonald Institute, uh, Triumph, uh, and many other, INF, uh, the uh, LNGNS in Italy, and other research centers like this that pursue uh, the the topic of dark matter and you can find a lot of resources there there for all ages to learn more about about this cool fundamental problem of course and and they can absolutely question darkmatterday.org which has a list of events and all kinds of things to get get involved in now just from you mentioning that it becomes really obvious this is an international effort like the whole the whole world is looking for dark matter right this isn't absolutely. just just yeah. a of, um endeavor yeah. One reason why this is true and why so many people are interested in this is that because we, what we need to re really understand is that everything that we have achieved so far in terms of, you know, of society and technological advancement and everything, we've only done with a very tiny subsection of the matter content of the universe. And so being able to try and unlock that significant portion of the matter content in the universe, it's really important because you really don't know what you can do once you have that knowledge, obviously. And that's why it's such an interesting uh, open question and it has drawn such large interest internationally, obviously. That's, wow. Okay, and you know, okay, this kind of, it, we have another question that kind of relates. Um, and it's, it's from actually the Snow Lab uh, Instagram feed. So will it's a two-parter. Will finding dark matter help us design better space exploration gear? Or um, I guess the other part is, is theory the goal? Like, is this purely just wanting to understand the fundamental nature of the universe? Or, or do you foresee potential practical benefits? That, that is a great question. I think there is a nice relationship between um, direct applications and what makes impacts in our life and fundamental physics. And the two things, I don't think they're decoupled. Um, so ultimately, yeah, we're pushing the boundaries and, and trying to understand the presence of dark matter purely from a theoretical perspective, if you want to say, or, or a scientific perspective. We want to understand what is the composition of the universe. We want to understand why is this mass portion of the universe that we don't understand. We want to understand if it's what kind of particle it is, as we discussed so far and whatnot. Uh, but the reality is that once you have all that knowledge, then we can think carefully about what that entails and what the implication of that, uh, of that knowledge is. I want to give you a, a great example is when people study, for instance, the positron back in, in, in the beginning of uh, uh, in the 50s, uh, sorry, in 1950s, uh, they really wanted simply to prove that antimatter exists. The, there is an equivalent particle of the electron, so what generates electricity, but positive. What they didn't know after they discovered the positron is that that was a fundamental discovery to then unlock the ability to develop semiconductors and, and, and everything that we do with semiconductors today, for instance, like for instance, our little cell phones, which are an incredible computer in your pocket. So you really don't know what, and I know that sometimes it might sound a little bit too sci-fi, and I get it, uh, but you don't know what you unlock and, and, uh, and you don't know what the impacts are going to be. But what you want to do is further that knowledge, create that, uh, that information, and then provide that information to the rest of the world so we can see if that could be used as a benefit, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Electricity was a, was a, started out as a parlor trick, right? Like we had exactly. no idea that it would have. Yeah. So I don't um, think the fundamental research and applications are somewhat separate. I think they're, they're, they're very well intertwined. Yeah, yeah, and history has has proven that for sure. Okay, so so we've talked a bit about the philosophy of it and sort of why we think it exists and that sort of thing. So let's get let's get a little bit more technical. Um, so you you currently work with the scintillating bubble chamber, which I love that name. 
Um, can you tell us uh, a bit more about that? I think we have some some pictures we can show of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think we can we can show a, a picture of the uh, layout of the experiment. Uh, um, so the scintillating bubble chamber is a, a it's a new project that is currently um, uh, being undertaken by collaborator members in Canada, U.S. and Mexico. Um, and our goal, you can see here, a, 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 an engineering uh, rendering of what the detector looks like. And so our goal is to put a liquid argon, so a uh, argon in its liquid form, inside a uh, a, a, a vessel. Um, and what we do is that we uh, change the pressure inside this liquid such that it's in a unique state where it should be in gas, but somehow, some way, because the transition was so slow, it remains in liquid. And that unique state, which we call superheated state, is really the fundamental bare bone of every bubble chamber detector. Um, so if you do some Google research, you can find more about bubble chambers. And what's really cool about the superheated state is that if we imagine a little dark matter particle coming in and interacting or communicating with an argon atom inside this chamber in a superheated state, uh, the dark matter particle would leave just enough energy to the uh, argon atom that will then be converted into heat. Uh, and that heat is enough to, to create a phase shift a phase shift from liquid to gas. And that actually generates a tiny bubble. And we can take a picture of that bubble, we can listen to that bubble, and we can look at the bubble from a light perspective, and we can uh, infer based on the size, the noise, and the amount of light that we see from the bubble, uh, if, that in, if that bubble was created by uh, any other subatomical particle that we know, or perhaps something that we don't know, like a dark matter particle coming in and interacting. And uh, it's a new technique. It's, a, it's, a, it's based on, as I said, on bubble chambers, which is somewhat proven in the field of dark matter. Uh, the PICO collaboration, for instance, have been uh, uh, working on bubble chambers and producing uh, world-leading results uh, for many years. Uh, and we hoping that this uh, next step would enable us to search for a new, very specific type of dark matter, which is what we call light uh, WIM, or light uh, weakly interactive massive particle, uh, and uh, to provide a, a world leading result, or at least provide a, a world competitive uh, result uh, for, for this particular type of dark matter. And I have another picture to show of the actual detector next to an historically large bubble chamber. I just wanted to show you that sometimes you can do uh, more with little. So here you can see a picture, for instance, of SPC on the right on its current standing. So this is the uh, inner vessel inside here is where the argon will go. And then in the background, you can see an historic bubble chamber that was used for particle physics application um, a while back. And this is this picture is taken at Fermilab in Chicago, uh, Illinois, in the United States, a great uh, uh, physics center as well. Uh, and so just to give an idea that sometimes, depending on the purpose of the physics you, you can do, not all experiments have to be massive. Sometimes even the little one do a lot of work. That's very cool. And so where is the scintillating bubble chamber right now? Uh, right now we are assembling uh, the first version and sort of we want to understand how it behaves and how it operates a little more. And so that installation and then construction is currently happening at Fermilab in Chicago. Uh, Illinois. And then the next step, once we have completed that, our next step is to uh, then uh, re uh, build a secondary chamber exactly the same to the one that is currently uh, in Chicago and deploy it underground at Snow Lab to do, again, a dark matter search um, or looking for what we call this light wimp. Okay. So Snow Lab is uh, just outside of my, my hometown, <laughs> the town I call home, Sudbury, Ontario. Um, and I know there's there's world class research going on in Snow Lab, and I'm wondering if you can give us some insight into uh, why you would want to put your chamber in Snow Lab. Why it looks oh, absolutely. Uh, so first off, Snow Lab, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, an underground laboratory facility that, as as mentioned, is placed in Sudbury, uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, the laboratory itself, which is a a clean room, meaning there's very little dust and very little. Uh, uh, let's say dirt, <laughs> uh, if people want to, uh, want to have an idea. Uh, it's really a super clean lab and it's placed two kilometers underground in an active nickel mine. What makes this laboratory truly unique, and there, there are other underground facilities across the world. There are uh, places in the US, there are, there's a place in Italy, uh, LNGNS, uh, there are other facilities in the world. But what makes, in my opinion, Snow Lab unique 
is the fact that we have uh, we go on we have an, a laboratory underground. So we actually have two kilometers of rock fully around us. Well, some other laboratories, for instance, they actually take other routes and they place those uh, laboratories underneath a mountain, say, for instance, where you get more of a, uh, a coverage by the existence of the mountain itself. The reason why we choose underground facilities and underground laboratories is because we want to shield our detectors. We want to block uh, every possible cosmic activity. So any kind of particle that comes from, our, from the universe into our atmospheres and then generates even more particles in our, in our atmosphere, which is what we call cosmic rays or cosmogenic activities. And by putting two kilometers of rock between the surface and your detector, you block all of that. But as we said earlier, dark matter doesn't really like to communicate that much with regular matter. So we do expect dark matter to still stream through two kilometers of rock, like if it was you know, a hot knife and butter, really. And so that's why we place them down there. And once you get two kilometers on the ground, it's really a state-of-the-art facilities uh, you don't even, once you're down there, you don't even uh, realize that you're two kilometers on the ground. It really feels like a state-of-the-art laboratory, and it's, it's quite unique. It's like really being in a space with some awesome way two kilometers on the ground. <laughs> I actually got to do a tour, and I admittedly, I was fantasizing the whole time that I was in a Mars space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it certainly has that feel to it, for sure. Yeah, they even have their own um, sewage processing plant, which I found fascinating. Um, but... Okay, here's another question. So you, you mentioned that it's really clean. Um, and what's the reason for that? Why does it need to be so clean? Yeah, so one of the difficulties, um, as we mentioned earlier, I know it's a point that I keep stressing, but it's important. Dark matter very rarely likes to talk to ordinary matter. So what you need to make sure when you build an experiment or when you're trying to look for something that is so faint and quiet, uh, you want to make sure that you eliminate any other a particle, let's say, or any other uh, component that can generate noise or a signal in your detector that could mimic a dark matter particle. And so it turns out that, as you know, as we know, uh, dust or you know, random dirt or or like even non-filter air has a large radioactive content in it. Now that radioactive content, which normally is interpreted in radon or lead or whatever people like to uh, refer it to. It's relatively harmless to people unless you sit in a pile of lead uh, or you start ingesting lead. But normally those radiation levels are completely harmless to people. But however, those radiation levels, while harmless to people, are significant enough that they completely hinder the ability of an experiment to measure dark matter. So we really need to place ourselves in an environment that is really quiet, not only by shielding the two kilometers of rock from all the cosmogenic activities and all the noise that is up here, but also from cleaning all the components and making sure that everything stays clean so that no dust and no radon or lead uh, enters our detector and therefore creates noise in the process. That's interesting to think about, just that, that we actually, we think of space as being a high radiation environment, but I mean, Earth is also a radiation environment because, well, I guess, because we're in space, right? <laughs> we're absolutely, but, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so so you get to go and you get to work in Snow Lab and, and you're part of a research team, like about how, how big is the team that you're part of? Uh, so we're on the order of uh, 30, 40 researchers. Uh, as I said, at the moment, SPC is spread across Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Uh, but normally, those collaborations can really vary. Some experiments are on the scale of SPC, and some experiments are at a somewhat larger scale, say, for instance, two or 300 people. Um, and what I really like about our community is that we really have this mentality of trying to share as much as we can, even among collaborations and different projects. So that if you get stuck on a problem and you solve it, you know, if you make that solution available, then we don't have to go through the same problem. And chances are we're going to solve a problem that you're going to be stuck on at a later time. So there really is that, that nice sense of camaraderie, which I really like. Uh, specifically to, to, to individual collaborations, normally the way it works is that you build a team of, of scientists, which you really to some degree, it feels very much like when you build a sports team. Uh, you really put together a lot of scientists from a lot of different places and a lot of different backgrounds, and everybody has their role to play in it. Uh, some people uh, might be responsible for some components of the detector. Some people might be responsible for uh, some analysis studies or some different portions of it. Uh, but you, everybody pitch, pitches in and as fairly as possible to, to push 
and ultimately make this experimental program or, or this research uh, happening and, and be successful. And you really create that sense of camaraderie and it kind of becomes like your own little pet, you know? Uh, yeah. you, you kind of becomes almost personal, you know? <laughs> and you've and got a direction. clear and compelling goal, right? Like there's this, this curiosity that-, that That's should, right. That's, That's really right. And, 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 you know, you get to work with a lot of incredible people from all, all over the world. So for us, the idea of uh, uh, communicate regularly uh, on the Internet and, and communicate with those, uh, those channels were, were somewhat of a norm. Uh, obviously, we live in an abnormal situation, so it's even more so than usual. Uh, but yeah, normally in scientific community, there are a lot of meetings that happen online because you have to talk to people that might be on the opposite side of the world or it might be across the border in the U.S. Uh, and so it's important to keep that connection available. And it's very important in science to keep communications up so that uh, we can distribute knowledge as much as we can. And it's, it's exciting to hear that it's that it's not um, it's not like the race to the moon where there's sort of this competition happening between countries. It's it's become international collaboration and it's really a, a human endeavor, which is really heartening. So I think there is a little bit of healthy competition, meaning everybody strives to get there as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly, you won't feel, let's say, uh, a, uh, a very strong, uh, like a sports-like uh, competition where, you know, it's, it's important that you, you know, that, that, that you win. I think it's, there's more of a, if, you know, we win as a community, which is very nice. Awesome. Well, okay, but let's, let's stick with that little, that sports analogy for another second. What, uh, what position do you play? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I can give you maybe an example with SBC, which is kind of uh, a simple example. So uh, as I mentioned, we normally take different responsibility and we try to all pitch in. Uh, personally, what I'm responsible for is the design, uh, development and, 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 and construction of the photoelectric uh, system or basically the system that is designed to measure any flash of light that occurs inside our detector. Um, you know, as particle interacts with the liquid argon through some chemistry, they actually emit uh, uh, that energy of the interaction that is transmitted from a particle to the argon can be converted to, to light, to a, basically a scintillation flash, that's what we call it. Uh, so my responsibility is design and developing that system. And uh, I also help uh, and coordinate the uh, on-site effort at Snow Lab so that I try to make sure that I help my, my collaboration as much as we can to uh, smoothen the transition from our current structure to an, an active detector on the ground as much as, as we can. But as I said, it's important to know that this is really a, a team effort. And some of the people sort of take a lead, let's say, but it, everybody pitches in in almost every aspect. You know? So skin, so scintillating bubble chamber, it really is sort of scintillating. You could almost say like sparkling a little, like to yeah. put it. <laughs> Depending on if you have somebody perturbing the system, let's say, or if you have a subatomical particle that managed to communicate with an argon atom, uh, that atom gets really happy, really excited that the communication happened. And so that excitement sometimes comes out in forms of uh, heat, sometimes it comes out in forms of, of light, scintillation, and sometimes it comes out in form of charge, so electricity and electrons, basically. Mm -hmm. And sound, right? Because we're also listening. That's right. That's more of a consequence of, of the bubble its formation. Yeah, and sound as well. That's right. You have also that dimension as well. Very cool. So um, how, how, did you, how did you get here? How, what was your journey to becoming a, a dark matter researcher in a laboratory two kilometers underground, super futuristic, um, collaborating with people across the world? How did you get here? It's a very good question. And uh, the answer is that it wasn't a single step, obviously. Uh, you don't just uh, realize, okay, I'm I'm just gonna go and work there. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it happens, and that's and that's cool. For me, really, it was kind of a two-step process. First, I I realized I wanted to be a physicist, and I wanted to get involved with science and 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 doing that stream because I really wanted to find something that sparked my interest, that kept me interest, that I thought was personally super cool. And something that I could, that was important, that I could make a good contribution and, and make the world a better place. So that kind of zoomed in into physics. And then once I got into physics and I did all my undergraduate courses and whatnot, 
Uh, and I started working for my undergraduate thesis with my uh, professor at the time, supervisor at the time, Professor Jocelyn Monroe. Uh, that's when I started hearing about dark matter and neutrinos, so the sort of dark sec, the, the, this invisible portion of the universe. And that's when I really got interested. And the fact that really got me interested was the fact that dark matter makes up for such large component of the universe and we know so little about it. It just kept me awake at night. I had to, I had to be part of that, of that research, you know? I uh, just had to, and then I just went through the I just went through the standard process, uh, as in to answer more technically how I got uh, to Snow Lab. I I went through I I looked around for uh, PhD positions that were uh, experiments that I found interesting in dark matter. Talked to different people. I ended up at Queen's University in Canada. For, I started originally in England at Royal Holloway University. Uh, ended up at Queen's where I did my PhD and then followed again. Following that path, I ended up at Triumph, and now you're at Snow Lab doing uh, dark matter research. So again, it's a career in process, but it was driven mostly by the interest uh, uh, of doing something cool and the importance of answering the dark matter problem. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I would argue that you are making the world a better place because I really feel like this kind of work where people, you know, demonstrate you know how to work together internationally, how to collaborate, how to share information, how to um, really look for evidence about the way things actually are the way that you know everyone can can see and understand and replicate is is just a really important part of being human and, and surviving <laughs> i couldn't agree more i think that's really fundamental you know yeah and it's fun and exciting that's that's yeah. very cool and you can do a lot of very cool things in the process you know doing fundamental science gets really fun and it's really fun and you can do a lot of cool stuff in the process. You get to learn a lot about different technologies. You get to learn about the structure of the universe. You get to learn a lot of things, really. It's pretty cool. And you get to travel? We get to travel a lot, yes. Well, obviously, uh, you know, again, we live in the reality right now, obviously. Uh, but in general, absolutely, because as we said, it's really an international effort. And so it's really important to maintain this connection and being able to talk to people around the world to really uh, stay on top of your field and really try to communicate as much as we can so that we can all help each other out as much as we can. Wonderful. So we're getting fairly close to the end of our time and I just want to encourage anyone out there who has a question or even just has a thought, like, what do you think? Do you think it's, is it, is it worth it? Should we be hunting for dark matter? <laughs> or should Pietro have, you know, I'm in. Said something else and wondered about something else and forgotten, not, not cared about the mystery? Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? Are you, uh, are you wondering? About, about the universe yourself. I'm also uh, wondering, do you have any anything you'd like to say to someone who is is maybe still in elementary school or maybe high school or even university and sort of just starting out in their career, but they have that same kind of wondering of, okay, yeah, there's, you know, we've heard about the Big Bang and there's the universe, but, you know, what is it really? Or, or you know, what comes after? You know, just really interested in those sort of fundamental questions about about the world we live in. What kind of advice would you give them? Uh, first off, uh, don't push back your curiosity. Uh, your curiosity, it's, it, it's good. Uh, if you have any questions or if you uh, feel like you wanna learn more about something or if, if you find something interesting and you wanna learn more, uh, don't be afraid of asking questions. Don't be afraid of finding people that uh, you think may have the, the answer and asking them the questions. Reach out to people. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with asking questions. And sometimes that's the easiest way to get really interested. You start hearing uh, about a topic, you ask some questions, that it gets you even more interesting and it's exciting. So my, my first advice is obviously reach out to as many people as you can until you feel like you satisfied uh, your curiosity. Um, the second thing I, I would uh, suggest is that there are a lot of opportunities that sometimes people are not aware of until so maybe sometimes a little bit too late. But really from both elementary school all the way up to high school and then even, you know, undergraduate and graduate school, there are a lot of cool opportunities to get involved in the science or there are a lot of cool opportunities uh, to uh, make significant contribution regardless of your age. I think we, I was uh, reading the news a couple of days ago about a 12-year-old a girl in the U.S. who was doing a science project and ended up making a significant contribution to the research uh, on the COVID vaccine, for instance, with her science project. And that's incredible. And there's really no reason why um, many other people can do that. So look, some of, look for some of those opportunities in your areas, whether it's a, an online science fair at the moment or any other ways. There are a lot of cool ways to contribute. Uh, and most importantly, 
don't keep feeding your curiosity until you feel like you're satisfied keep asking those questions that's great advice yeah definitely and i i, I definitely agree about finding um, mentors and people who who share your interest and curiosity because it's just it's a great feeling to to be able Absolutely. to yeah and it's very easy to reach out to people even by email you know uh, and and i think uh, people are happy to respond to, to to questions that's awesome okay well i don't see any more questions in in our chat line um but we'll give it like one more minute and maybe while we're doing that if you just do you have any last thoughts anything you'd like to to share with us today uh make sure you check out uh all the opportunities that dark matter day has to offer mm -hmm. uh and uh, if you want to learn more if you have more direct questions feel free to ping me uh off, on twitter or uh, or other platform i'm more than happy to answer this question maybe if you have something following up today that's awesome thank you for that so much pietro and Thank you for your time today and having this conversation with us. And thank you to everyone who joined in. I really appreciate the questions that you sent. And I also want to say thank you to Renata for all her support behind the scenes. Thank you. And uh, if you do, yeah, want to join in on more Dark Matter activities, check out darkmatterday.org. And for those of you who are on Twitter, a sarcastic dark matter particle will be taking over the Snow Lab Twitter feed this Friday, October 30th. It's an annual event that is as hilarious as it is informative. So yeah, until next time. Thanks again for the opportunity. Bye.